Yeah. So she's picking on you guys, and she's in the same boat. Well, here we are. And uh, I was thinking this is kind of silly, but, you know, uh, just to clear things up, when people say, I don't know where I'd be without my mother, the concept nil comes to mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we can all safely say all humans exist because of mothers. Um, so, but I, I get the concept. I want to move on, and, and I appreciate uh, my mother was, uh, what she did give me was a belief in the Lord. She taught that to us, and that's good. And, and I've always admired that with Debbie, that she tenaciously brings uh, the Lord back into the lives of our children over and over again. And, and I suppose that connects to some extent of what I want to talk about because I want to stick to the, the program, which is uh, dealing with Jeremiah and, and a post-Christian nation. And, and, and I come to this, this idea of putting God first. And there are a lot of distractions that would interfere with us putting God first. And um, so as, as we think in those terms, uh, it's a place where God challenges. Here in Jeremiah chapter 22, we, we find this place where God begins to challenge the political leader of the nation. And, and we could say leaders. It just so happens that it was a monarchy, so, so he focused more on the king. But, but I, I, I think that's worth looking at. And, and one of the things on my heart and mind about it is, uh, yes, we, we understand in, in our environment and in, in a lot of in nations and places people can find themselves. We understand that, that people themselves can be led off astray and, and people themselves can be corrupt and, and, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We understand that. But I think it's important as Christians that we understand that um, with, without disrespect towards an office of leadership, we have, to, we have to be able to season what we're hearing and the kind of leadership we see with the word of God. And, and I'm reminded of something Jesus said. I didn't put it in my notes, but I remember the Lord saying this in the Gospels where he makes this point and, and he's telling his followers, the Pharisees, um, sit in the seat of Moses. So listen to them, but don't do what they do. And, and there's that element uh, where he's saying, honor the office, but don't get sucked into the hypocrisy. And, and I think that's, that's really uh, good. And, and a lot of times, it, this great opportunity to talk about what a Pharisee really was uh, in, in the, that culture. And... Uh, we hear a lot in the Bible, uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees, and they weren't the only uh, divisions or, or groups of Jew, Judaism in, in the first century. But you hear a lot about the Pharisees and Sadducees. And politically, they were really more like political movements than just religious movements because it was a religious nation. And the Sadducees were conservative, and the Pharisees were pretty liberal. And so we, we kind of come to that. And uh, what happened with the Pharisees, though, and, and when I say liberal and conservative, the Sadducees believed that if you were going to be a spiritual leader in the nation, you received that the way the Old Testament taught, which was that you emerged into that leadership because of your family line. And the Pharisees decided anybody could be a leader if they wanted to, and the Sadducees strictly wanted to stick to what the Word taught, it, taught and the Pharisees uh, had a lot of dreams and and stuff like that where some might have been from God and some weren't, you know. And, and in fact, I was talking to someone, I don't even know who, recently, uh, and I said, well, you know, if everybody that heard from God, heard from God, then everybody would agree. <laughs> and so we know not everybody hears from God. And... And we get that. And, and so the Pharisees, what happens during the Babylonian captivity, this, is, this comes after Jeremiah, but they, they've gone into Babylon and the Pharisees take opportunity to, because of the absence of the temple, they take opportunity to emerge into leadership and control of the, of the 
church essentially and the synagogues appear and things like that and so they were lay leaders and and that was part of the conflict and the reason i i'm telling this is because what jesus is saying is if you look in the original greek jesus identifies that the pharisees have taken the seed of moses they've taken authority and um I, I think that's part of what we want to guard our hearts with, uh, is that we, we want to recognize biblical leadership and biblicity and everything, but we don't want to become aggressive and just take over. Uh, and, and there's this balance. Uh, if you can't agree with something, remove yourself from it, those kinds of things. So, uh, but that, that's just a side note. What I really want to talk about is as, as people of God, you have, to, you have to taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself. You have to live in the word. And, and you have to be prepared not to be led astray by corrupt leadership. All right? And, and that's a struggle, isn't it? Uh, not here, we know that. But, but that, <laughs> that's a struggle. That's a, that's a challenge in our world. And, and uh, we're going to see there's three groups of leadership that, the, that Jeremiah addresses. I'm just dealing with one today, which is political leadership. But he addresses the priesthood, and then he addresses the prophets. And uh, we'll look at those later and, and what those categories would be. And, and essentially, when you read a priest in the Old Testament, you pretty much can associate a priest with a pastor because they had the same... Uh, basic responsibilities and and we certainly know what a king is and we know what a prophet is so he addresses these three groups and um, what I what, when I was reading this thing about political leadership what I kept coming down to is this that um, first and foremost leaders and, and, and I won't always keep saying political leaders so when I say leaders we're not talking about spiritual leaders today per se Although, how many know all leaders are spiritual leaders? You say, oh, not all. Well, no, some lead the wrong direction spiritually. But all leaders are spiritual leaders. And just, you know, it's Mother's Day, but I'll throw this out because I think it's something mothers would like to hear, like people to hear. Um, fathers are leaders of the home. And I've heard fathers say, well, my wife really is. Uh, no, you are. And if you abdicate your spiritual leadership, your children will suffer. And you put an unfair burden on your wife. So that's not a sermon. That's just what I think. And you'll have to live with that. But, um, or not. You can forget all about it. Uh, but leaders need to come to realize that God rules over them. And I think that's the issue of the day. And, and that certainly applies whether it's a secular leader or a spiritual leader. It applies whether it's a king, a, a, a politician, a priest, or a prophet. At some point, when things go wrong, when their hypocrisy emerges, it's because at some point a leader has forgotten that God rules over them. And that's also true in families, that, that as parents, whether, it's, whether it's a, you're a mother or a father, that when you, when you fail to realize that God rules over your leadership in the home, then, then you begin to take compromises that shouldn't be taken. And there's a humility required to live in submission before the Lord. And, and that's kind of where I'm coming to that. To that when you say, well, what does it mean? What does it really mean to put God first? And we could talk about what it looks like. And we could talk about the do's and the don'ts and the activities and things you could do that you say, well, that's what it is to put God first. But if you were to define it in the, just the most general term, that to put God first is all about humility. It's all about dismissing your personal pride and self-interest and pleasing him. Now, when you define it in that general category, it's easy to discover all the different ways you can put God first. And, and so, 
you know, something happened this morning uh, that that rarely happens where I live. You know, we live in, we actually do live in Newport, and and uh, so, and maybe a block and a half from the ocean. And so, I got up this morning and went outside in swim trunks and a t-shirt. That never happens here, right? And because I, I tend to run. You know, I tend to feel cold all the time anyhow. So I went outside. At first, I put on a jacket because I'm like, this is Newport. I'll put on a jacket. I was going to wash Debbie's car is what I was doing. And so I went out there to do that. And uh, I went, I don't need my jacket. What's this? <laughs> right? And so there, it, I almost forgot why I was telling the story, but I just remembered, fortunately. And I, I didn't need to tell you that, but, you know. For your per- entertainment purposes, you might as well know that. And, and so I get out there, and, and I'm washing the car. And, and as I'm washing it, I, I have this thought. I think I understand why people skip church some days. This feels good out here. If it was up to me, I would just, you know, I'd stay home today and do stuff outside in all this great weather. But it wasn't up to me. It was up to Debbie. But no, I'm kidding. It, it wasn't up to Debbie either. She thinks it is sometimes, but it's not. It was really up to the Lord. That if I'm going to put him first, my self-interests have to diminish. And when I think of, you know, I've, over the years I've heard people say, what's your heart verse? I didn't know I had one for a long time. Because, you know... As soon as people say something about the heart, I just kind of tune them out. But, uh, you know, what, what are some of the watchwords from Scripture that have guarded your heart through your life as a Christian? And one of those things that is just... Stu- and the Lord showed me this, in, and I, I remember saying to the Lord, I've never had a heart verse. And he goes, oh, yeah, you have. You just didn't know it. So I think he's right. And uh, so he says it's... And, and he tells it to me. And I went, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, that's guided my life. And it's in that moment, John the Baptist has been ministering. And, and John the Baptist was a big deal. A lot of people didn't realize that. He was a big deal. That the, the whole nation would come out to hear him. And the king thought he was pretty cool until, you know, he cut his head off. But, but he was a big deal. And suddenly Jesus comes on the scene... And people are not going to the church of John the Baptist anymore. They're not hanging out with him anymore. Some of his disciples have left. And the whole world's following the Lord. And, and, and they come to John and they say, uh, you see everybody's, you know, that guy that you told us about, the Lamb of God, everybody's following him. And here are the words of John the Baptist that have guided my heart as a Christian. He must increase, but I must decrease. And if you can't live your Christian life under that that umbrella, you are in danger. You are in danger. If you can't believe that everything you do is for the increase of the Lord, and to do that, you decrease your self-interest, your purpose, your pride, your sense of value, your sense of accomplishment, it all shrinks under the power that is God. And so I... We, we come to this understanding that if we as Christians are to put God first, it's all about humility, that we have to, at some point, stop seeking great things for ourselves. And, which is a scripture that's going to come up later in Jeremiah, and, and we'll talk about that at length when we get there. But he actually, it's one of my other heart verse things, and it just is a simple statement. Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. And I've watched this over my lifetime as a minister that every time people seek great things for themselves, their quality as a human being diminishes. Their sense of Christ-likeness dissipates. 
because they're desiring the very recognition and worship that they're supposed to be delivering to the presence of God. And that's the problem with pride. And, and, and you know, it starts way back in the garden, right? And that sort of thing. But, but, you know, it goes before that. That what was the sin of Satan? It was pride. Pride has a way of getting a hold of you and infecting the people around you. And that's why we read in scripture that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble or shows his favor upon the humble. And, and we begin to realize that if we can be people who don't seek great things for ourselves, God will do great things within us. I'm just looking at some of these notes. I, I, I put them down because I obviously felt led to and, and I... I trying to escape saying some of these things, but I'm going to say it. Um, if, if you're a pride-driven person, I don't mean this as an accusation, but just something, you know, things we have to talk about as human beings. If you think it's hard to feel pride well up within you all the time, you should try being one of the people around you. It's harder on them, trust me. That we think, oh, if I could just conquer this pride. Your pride is a burden to everyone that knows you. And it's only through the transformative power of the Lord Jesus Christ that we get delivered from that. So then I come to understand that people without humility can't understand the principles of humility. And, and, and here we see a promise of obedience. I'm going to get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So... Um, sometimes we want to look humble. How many know you want to look humble because nobody wants anyone who's prideful around them? We, we figure that out. And then there's this false humility that emerges. And uh, that's not the answer either because that's a facade of what's really inside. And I'll tell you that not only does humility help lead us to a submission to the Lord and a place whereby we put him first, but believe it or not, humility will lead you to the greatest self-confidence you could ever imagine. And everybody wants more self-esteem and more sense of self-confidence, but when you start esteeming others as more important than yourself, God rewards you with confidence. So, we have these things we're grappling with, and, and in this passage of Jeremiah, we see there's a promise that obedience could still lead them to a point of rescue. And, and that's good news. It's bad news for Israel because they have a political leader that will never humble himself. But, but when we see the mercy and grace of God and apply that to our lives, the good news is he always gives an opportunity so that's where we jump in on verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 22. And, and he says, if you, if you do what I say, then the kings who sit on David's throne will ride through the gates of this palace in chariots and on horses, along with their officials and their people. But if you don't do what I say, I will take an oath on myself, declares the Lord, that this place will become a pile of rubble. And, and so the significance of that, you remember in chapter 21, Babylon's attacking. They've been dismissing everything that Jeremiah has preached until all of a sudden they're under attack by Babylon and he's been telling them it's going to happen. And he wants hope and they want hope and, and, and he says, you know, it's probably not going to happen. You're probably not going to get out of this. But then he speaks to the king. And even as Babylon is attacking, we realize that God promises a chance of victory. And, and the king is Jehoiakim, and, and all that he has to do... Now think about this. The Lord is, is promising victory. He's saying, you know, all, all, there's one thing you can do. I mean, I'll, I'll give you victory over Babylon. I'll make Israel great again. The kings will march through the gates and the palace will be here and everything will be fantastic. All you need to do is humble yourself.
That's it. All the king has to do is humble himself and obey God. That's all it takes. Imagine going to a leader of a, of a city, a state, a nation, a community, a family, and saying, I, I know a key that will unlock greatness in your community. And they're like, oh yeah, I want to be, I want to be, how many, right? Because, you know, pride and politics start with P. And, um, and they're all like, I want to be the guy that makes it great again. I want to be the historical figure here. And you say, yeah, and all you have to do is humble yourself and obey God. Do you have anything else that might work? Would be the next question. And, and it's easy for us to look in that arena and say, yeah, those guys, they really need to get a hold of it. They, they, they need to change. But what about when the Lord comes to you as an individual and says, all you need to do for the blessings you seek in your life, all you need to do is humble yourself and obey me. And, and the natural answer, answer as a Christian is, oh, I can do that. And then he gets specific. And he makes suggestions of things that are sacred cows to you, important things to you. You know, let's say you're an addict and you're addicted to Oreo cookies. And he says, all you have to do is give up Oreos and humble yourself. You're like, well, God, you know, I don't know. Could I give up spinach or something? And, and here's the snag. The snag is that obedience to the word of God always requires an element of humility. Humility. That, that to really obey God's word, we have to begin to assume that we don't have all the answers and that we're not all, all that great. We have to assume that our ideas aren't as good as his. There is an element of humility that's necessary to be obedient. And we have to know that. You ever, you ever deal with a kid that knows everything? Your mother did. Um, I had a nephew, a funny little guy. He was cute when he was young, but uh, he grew out of it. And, uh, and he was one of those kids, he'd ask you a question. And he's just little. Uncle Charles, why do they do this? Why do they? And you, as soon as you answered his question, he'd say, I know it. And he's like five. I, mean, I think he got it from my brother, but... Um, you know, I know it. You ever deal with that? God does all the time. God does all the time. And so we come to this realization that not only... If the king humbles himself and obeys the Lord, they can be great again, but if he doesn't, they'll be destroyed. And here we learn that the only way for a nation to be truly great is to submit to God. It's the only way. Without that submission, great, greatness is no longer an option. Humbling yourselves before God is our only path of hope. And, and so I want to read a scripture in Proverbs chapter 3. I'll read 5 through 8. It says, Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path smooth. Do not consider yourself wise. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then your body will be healed and your bones will have nourishment. Here we learn that the collective intelligence of man is not the answer. And, and 
not only do individuals struggle with pride, but all of humanity does, doesn't it? And they're quick to, how many people are quick with an answer though they don't know the topic? You ever notice that? Everybody's got advice. Just get sick sometime and you'll get a lot of unlicensed medical advice. Right? That's something in us that needs that answer. And, and in fact, sometimes people get a little surprised because they'll ask me something. I say, I actually don't know anything about that. And I'm willing to admit it. And, and, and this thing where if humanity, what would happen to our world? If we would trust in the Lord with all our heart and not rely on our own understanding. I think that happens in heaven, by the way. Where would we be? Where would our nation be? Where would we as people be? Where would our families be? Where would you as an individual be? And, and so we, we begin to challenge the collective intelligence of man, right? Uh, which is an interesting phrase. We talk about the collective intelligence of man and the problem is, has man really collected intelligence? And, and it, that's an that's a issue. And, and we understand there's that element of humanity that, that, that states the only thing we can know exists is that which we can see. And the only thing that does exist is what we can see and understand. Which is odd because we're beginning to discover things we didn't know about. And they didn't suddenly start to exist. And so there's this arrogance that rise up with it, rises up with it. Us. And, and I remember years ago, uh, we were driving to church and Debbie's talking to me and... and you know, it's like, why are the, I, I don't know what she was, where she was headed, and I was probably the wrong person to ask, but it was this thing of, you know, the, the, the blue sky and the green trees and all this stuff looks good. Why are these things green and these things blue? And, and I probably could have given some other answer, but I, it, the bottom line is that's how God wanted it. And I was sharing that in, in a public setting, and, uh, and I said, uh, you know, God could have made red grass. Because, you know, he's God. And this guy comes up to me, he thought, he was quite the scientist, said, no, he couldn't make red grass because of the chlor chlorophyll issue. I said, so when God was creating, he's like, I'm stuck here. The grass has to be green. Because it has more authority than I do. It's not blue. Don't help me preach. <laughs> and we begin to think about who God really is. And, and we come to the scripture in 1 Corinthians one twenty one that says... For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And we begin to realize this statement is fascinating. That man in his wisdom knew not God. And every time humanity raises its belief in its own wisdom, it loses some knowledge of who God is. And when we say, well, well why, why, is, why are people so dumb about things today? Because they are. It comes back to man and his wisdom knew not God. That, that when we identify the very fall of man exists, that, that, that when Adam was originally designed and made in the image of God and, and Eve was then made in the image of Adam, which is the same, you know, because he says in the image of God made he male and female and there's this sense of equality and, and we understand that. 
And, and that happens, but afterwards they commit a sin that causes them to fall. They now have a new nature called the fallen nature, and we all live with that. That man begins to fall short of original design. And, and that's an issue. And the other issue is that as man turns away from God, he submits to the ways of the devil. And the devil is the father of lies. If you submit to the father of lies, you're destined for deception. And we, we, we have to come to this, this the trusting in our own wisdom is the exact opposite of leaning on, not on our own understanding and trusting God in all our ways. And, and it unfortunately creeps into the spiritual arena. And we, we realize the human race needs to stop considering itself wise. And I haven't talked about this in a while, and there's new people here, so it'll seem new, so that's good news. Some of you go, I've heard that before, don't help, all right? Don't, don't, when I'm speaking, don't turn to your neighbor and tell the punchline or anything like that, because you're not helping, you're interrupting, and it's called heckling, and we don't like it. And uh, so they, they did a study on beluga whales and found that the average IQ of a beluga whale this hurts my feelings, it's 155. What's yours, right? Did that bother you a little bit? That's the average, that's not the smart ones. Now you could ask all the questions, how do they test the IQ of a beluga whale, how do they, why, why do they test the IQ of a beluga whale, etc. Man is not the smartest creature on the planet. He's just the one God made in his image and breathed life into. It isn't our intelligence that makes us unique. It's the breath of God that makes us unique. And, and you realize this is what gets us in humanity. Your average blue go well is borderline genius. But in beluga well dumb or whatever you, beluga well, in, 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 but I don't know what you want to call it, but in their world, I'm not a, I'm no, not only am I not a rocket scientist, I'm no beluga well. In, in, their, in their world, the geniuses are just average. So what about the pride of humanity? It's an interesting struggle And the, we, we, we know from reading scripture, what's the beginning of wisdom? Someone's afraid to say it, but they know it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's in the Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why is humanity losing wisdom? It's losing its fear of the Lord. And, and then Proverbs 3, 7 says, Do not consider yourself wise, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And, and this is the fun part because there's always someone who, says, who wants to come and say, well, you know, that means respect. And I say, well, the word yare in Hebrew actually means to be afraid. Well, what God meant to say was, no, no, here's the thing. I think, I think God has a grasp of language. How many believe that God has a grasp... I do. I, I think not only was he a master at Hebrew, which was the original language of this text, he's probably a master in English too. And I think in God's infinite wisdom, he knew which word to put there. And, and there's something about mankind doesn't want to fear God. And what is that about? Why doesn't mankind want to fear God? Because mankind is full of himself. And it did start in the garden. When, when Eve is looking at the forbidden fruit and the serpent begins to tempt her and, and she looks at it and it says she reasoned with herself that it was good for food and it could make you wise. 
that in, in her wisdom, she decided God was foolish and overruled him in her life. And that's, that's the definition of all sin. That in, in our moments of temptation, there are those times when we decide that God is foolish and we overrule his authority and we do the wrong thing. Now we as a nation are doing the exact opposite of what is necessary for victory victory and great gain and and we're not humbling ourselves as a nation and that's uh, most nations have that problem the word is ethnocentrism you think yours is the greatest place in the world happens in churches too when i was superintendent every time i go to a church they need a new pastor or something and i'd go meet with the council they'd all start like this there's no other church like our church yeah okay they probably are. <laughs> probably are. And when I was a teacher in school, you know, you'd parent, parent teacher conferences. My child's gifted. I'm like, at what? <laughs> My child's special. It's like, yeah, that's the opposite of gifted. But, but um, will you go through that? They want you to believe, and, and I remember having that conversation with a, a, some parents one day. I said, you know, there's, and it was a big class. I said, there's 32 kids in this class that I'm teaching. And, and you, you really think I'm supposed to think your child's more important than the others? And I think, I think it's natural to think your kid's great. I think we should. I, I think giving them praises and encouragement is very important. But at the same time, let's not let pride take off, take over where humility leaves off. And, and in a nation, I think we fail that in that department. And, and so finally we come to the spiritual thing. When the church leans on its own understanding, it's lost. And, and that's, that's my purview of expertise is, is what, what happens in the body of Christ. When the body of Christ becomes prideful about how it can do sacred things, when it becomes overconfident in, this, in its ability to handle the spiritual, it becomes lost. So I, I, just as an example, I was reading an article that uh, was on my desk and it was about it's about worship, you know, how to make it better, blah, blah, blah. And it, it really was a lot of blah, blah, blah. And um, I'm reading it, and every, every single point was mechanical and physical and would have applied to a secular concert. And nothing was said about getting on your knees and humbling yourself in the presence of God. Now, I've, I've studied worship, and here's what I've learned, and I, I want you to, I want us all to get this. Worship isn't about you. It's about Him. And only Him. It doesn't matter if you're good at it or bad at it. It's about him. And, and, and I think that's so significant. You say, well, and, and I'm just going to say it. I think one of the unfortunate things that has happened in the body of Christ is that the musically gifted have confiscated worship from everybody else. And I don't care if you sound like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs when you sing. But I, th I, I like that one. But uh, I think that's worship. I have an acquaintance, and, and uh, he's, honestly, he's a big deal. And uh, I don't want to mention who he is, but he's a big, he was a big deal. And he's just an acquaintance. We're not buddies or anything. But I met him first when I was 14. And what struck me by him was his humility and, and how he responded to me as a kid that was lost. And, 
and all that's good. But he, he was, I remember reading one of his books and he wrote a book uh, that was talking about in, in the area where I went to school. Uh, he went into a church service and this guy, this guy is musically gifted beyond anything I could dream of, right? I once saw him sing Yankee Doodle Dandle, Dandy while he played something else and tapped his foot to something else. He had three songs going on at once. It's just phenomenal stuff that he could do. And, uh, and beautiful voice, talented. Went to a church service and, and he was talking about two young guys that were leading songs and, and they, they did a couple old hymns, you know, um, I know the hymns, let's see. Just a closer walk with thee, and I've decided to follow Jesus. And, and they were singing, and they were horrible. Their timing was off, their voices were off, they butchered the song, they didn't get the melody right. Everything was wrong. And he got in the car, and he shook his head and kind of laughed at it, and thought, that was horrible. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I like what they did better than what you're doing. See, when God hears us worship, he hears the heart of man. And if we think it's about mechanics, we don't comprehend worship. If we think worship is about music, we don't understand worship. That worship in the original language means to kiss the master's hand. Not to kiss your own, aren't I great? Listen to me sing. That's not worship. That's hypocrisy. And, and you say, well, well, what makes good preaching? Good preaching is good worship. Nothing else. You, you think I do this because you like it? Do you think I do it because I like it? Certainly not. A lot of people say, you think give up preaching? The day the Lord says I can, I will. Because in simple terms, in psychological terms, I'm a gregarious loner. In simple terms, I'm a smiling introvert. When we were talking about retirement, Debbie's like, where would you want to live? Where would you want to? I said, I don't care as long as I can be a recluse. It's worship. It's bowing yourself to the Lord. And I'm not a vocalist, and, and, uh, and, and I remember Debbie and the kids were gone. I don't remember the details, but I was home alone, and, and uh, I was surprised. The Lord just kind of was doing stuff in my soul. And I used to keep my instruments in the closet, you know. I'd just stick them in there like a guitar, a mandolin. We'd just put it in the closet because I'm not going to use it for a while, and my dad would get mad. He'd come home, where's your, where's your mandolin? Where's your, oh, it's in the closet. And he'd say, it's from a scripture, get your harp out of the willow. But um, he, uh, he's like, well, you can't play it in the closet. I'm like, I don't need to. So I was sitting there and the Lord says, Charles, why don't you sing to me anymore? And my answer was just as logical as could be. Because I can't. I said, Lord, I can't sing. He says, I've never said that to you. He says, in all our relationship, I have never told you that you weren't worshiping right. He says, that's the one thing you got going for you. Your heart's always been right in it. Do you understand what God thinks versus what we think? The decisions of our lives are about putting God first. And, and the secular advice doesn't lead us spiritually. And we come to this realization that integrity demands humility and humility demands integrity. 
and that the problem with pride is that it's dishonest. You know, there's a scripture that says, man will not fail to proclaim his own righteousness. And I've discovered when people are proclaiming their own righteousness, they have the gift of exaggeration. It also says, when a man speaks of himself, he seeks his own glory. And we realize that bragging is exaggeration of truth. And, and, and so we come to this thing with Jehoiakim, that, that he's de- how he's defining his success. And the Lord tells him, do you think, and this is verse 15, do you think you're a better king than others because you use more cedar? Your father ate and drank and did what is fair and right. Everything went well for him. And he compares Jehoiakim to his father and he says, so you're using fancy building materials and everything looks cool, but I honored your father's integrity. Luxury and extravagance do not define success. Christ-likeness defines success. Being like Jesus. A, a beautiful courthouse or a beautiful capital building does not guarantee justice. How many know that? Any more than stained glass windows leads to holiness. And so, when the Lord says, there's hope for you, if you humble yourself, there's hope. But then he says, I know you're not going to. That's harsh, but it's a reality. Where are we with that? And, and so that's, a, you could read in verse 21 where it talks about that. I just want to wrap this up. But, but we begin to realize that Jehoiakim has a history, a track record from birth until that point where he has always faithfully disobeyed God. That's, you know, it's like, oh, he was faithful at disobeying the Lord. And the question for us is people, look, we know this. We're not going to solve the problems of, how many know you're not really going to solve the problems of the nation? I mean, you will around coffee and you're brilliant. I get it. But really, really, you you don't have that scope of influence. It's not going to happen. You're not going to fix it. If they would just put you in the White House, we'd all be thrilled. But that's not going to happen. Okay, I might have been sarcastic there. But what about you as a person, as an individual? What is your track record with listening to the Lord? What history do you have? Is it a, is it, is it a history that says, I'm faithful to obedience? Or, and I don't want this, you know, is exaggerated truth thing. I mean, look at your soul. Are you faithful to obedience or are you faithful to disobedience? Which is it? Be honest with yourself. And then do something about it. That's the big deal, isn't it? And and right now as I'm talking, and I'm just going to say this so, you know, not really let anyone off the hook, but to make the hook bigger. Sometimes people think, oh, right now is a good time for me to have an altar call. Absolutely not. I am not going to have you come up here and sear your conscience and go out and live like the devil. I'm not going to let you come up here and shed crocodile tears and pretend like God did something in you and nothing changes. The hook is bigger than that. You know the truth. Do something about it. When a person humbles himself, he will truly put God first. And putting God first is everything. When serving God, it doesn't matter how you do, so long as God is honored. And you say, well, what if I fail? Failure is fine. It's the lack of effort that's the problem. Well, Charles, have you ever felt? Well, probably not, but you know, I'm me. No, of course I have. I do it all the time. Failure's an option. Because God makes a difference. And we fail forward, we stumble into success with the Lord. 
but we keep coming back to him and humbling ourselves. But when a person justifies themselves, they can't find repentance. So, my mother uh, would sometimes get, try to get my brother and I to think differently based on cartoons that she put up around the house. Wasn't funny. I'm just saying, you know. Oh, isn't that cute? No, it's not. Especially when you're the only one home. <laughs> so, I was having a problem. My brother was in the army. I was having a problem. I was alone at home and and I'm I'm pretty lost. I'm walking out the door and there's this stupid cartoon I can still see today. Someone is trying to shove an elephant in a waste paper basket. Right? I mean, how do you forget that? You don't see that every day. Someone's trying to stuff this elephant in a waste paper basket. It's so like an idiot, I read the caption. Because I have this bad habit of reading words, anything that's written down sometimes. And... Uh, it said it's easier to stuff an elephant in a waste paper basket than to find forgiveness while justifying your sins. W wasn't funny. But it's true. Let's bow our heads. Lord, my prayer is that the, the prayers of repentance that are going to be offered up will happen throughout the week. It won't happen up front. Not that that's wrong. We know that. But Lord, that, that this will go deeper. That this will become a part of our daily life. That we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord so that he might lift us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, bless you. Happy Mother's Day. All that. you